Um, welcome again. Um, it's really great to, to be sharing God's word with you this morning. And um, if you put your finger in Ephesians 2, that's where we're going to be heading in a little bit. Um, uh, who knows what this is? Very good. Yes, you've passed your GCSE history exam. Give you certificates at the end. Probably, yes. So, yeah, this is the Berlin Wall, and I wanted to tell you a little bit about it. Um, I was, um, and then we're going to dig into our, our Bible, which is talking about the demolition of walls in Ephesians 2. The Berlin Wall had its origins at the end of World War II, when, when Germany was carved up into four pieces being occupied by Allied powers. So you can see here, we've got um, Germ Germany here. So the blue bit is where the, the, um, it was carved up into four different areas, um, American sector, British sector, and French sector. And then the red part was, the, was governed by the USSR, the, the Soviet area. So that was the agreement at the end of the Second World War. And, but within uh, Germany, the seat of government was Berlin. Okay? So as you can see from the left-hand picture, the Berlin was right in the middle of the Soviet-controlled area. And so Berlin itself was also carved up into four pieces, and so that, that they could share the governance of this um, of Germany at that point. And by so that was 1947. By 1948, the people had uh, had fled to West Berlin. So that's yeah, you can see that that's West Berlin. People were moving across to West Berlin to gain to gain asylum from the Soviet area, which they were struggling to live in. And so, and Stalin was trying to stop this movement of people across into the West Berlin, and so he started to cut off supplies um, in, in, um, and start travel restrictions to say, you know, you can't travel across, so that it was becoming more and more difficult. But people still were going across. I think it was, a, 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 I've lost what, how many it was now, I think it was roughly a million people went, moved from um, East Berlin to West Berlin during that time. So almost overnight, Stalin decided to build a wall to try and help, to try and prevent this mass migration to West Berlin. And that wall stood and separated families and, and separated the society, split it in two for nearly 30 years. So Berlin was divided not just by ideology in terms of government and politics of the Soviets compared to the more western area, but it was separated by this 27 mile long barrier that snaked through the city and it, was, it had uh, barbed wire, it had uh, attack dogs, and it had 55,000 landmines they planted. And many people lost their lives trying to get across um, over the years. But though it stood from 1961 to 1989, it could not survive a massive democratic movement at the end of that period that started to put massive pressure on the, the Soviet-controlled area, which they called the, the German Democratic Republic, GDR. And in 1989, many East Germans had had enough and they staged a series of mass demonstrations, demanded democracy, and the Soviet bloc was destabilized. And on November the 9th, 1989, East Berlin party official Gunter Schabowski announced upcoming travel reforms in response to the protest, but he botched his announcement in fact, that's him there. He botched his announcement, and so that it, it sounded like he was saying, the gates are open, you're free to go. From, and, and so because of that, um, thousands of people swarmed to the border. And, um, and the confused guards who hadn't received this information eventually opened the gates. 
and they started to move through. And as East Berliners pushed through, tens of thousands of West Berliners met them in a massive outpouring of celebration with champagne and music and tears and there's many pictures. And Berliners literally began to tear down with um, sledgehammers the, the wall, which you can see. And there's a picture before, I think, of them t just starting to pull off the barbed wire. And Berlin was started to be transformed. And less than a month later, the Soviet area um, collapsed entirely, the GDR. And in 1990, Germany was officially reunified. It's crazy to me. It, it, this sounds like something that is a, it's a, long, a long way ago in history. But actually, a lot of this it crosses our lifetime, doesn't it? It's like it's a lot of us here today can say, oh, yeah, that's in my lifetime. This stuff's happened. They put a wall, and it stopped people from moving across two areas. But we know that what happened then, after the war in Germany, is still happening today, isn't it? And we know many countries where difficulties remain. But Berlin, for the Berlin Wall for me represents our own human condition to put up walls to each other. Walls between nations, walls between relationships, walls between those we fear and we don't understand. And today, I want to speak to you about the only lasting way to demolish walls in this world which we're going to find in our Bible text, the only lasting way to demolish walls in this world. I want to, I want to, I want to look at this in three different sections. The, this Ephesians 2 passage that I'll be looking at, um, it flows quite nicely. And first of all, we, I want to describe how we're walled in, you know, and this, looking at what happened in Germany, helps us to understand the condition, the human condition, but Paul describes it again in Ephesians 2. And then I want to look at how Jesus Christ has demolished walls in this world and how reunification of humankind is now happening because of Jesus Christ. Well, the word reunification is very interesting because um, it, re, if you type it into a Google search, you find it's all about the Berlin Wall kind of thing. So it's almost like this word was, but I, I felt like really like a significant word. So please turn to Ephesians 2. We're going to read together from verse 11. Um, where is it? Ephesians 2. Verse 11, it starts... Therefore, remember that formerly you who were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcision by those who call themselves circumcision, that done, by, that done in the body by hands of men, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ, excluded from the citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenant of promise and without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by abolishing it in his flesh. By abolishing in his flesh the law with its commandments and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new man out of the two, thus making peace. And in this one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross, by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. And through him we both have access to the Father by one spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets 
with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. Paul talks about, the, he's, he's writing to the Ephesians and he's trying to talk to them about the, their condition that they, that they've, we've only had one half of the letter, but we have this impression that, that they've, they're asking Paul what it means to be Jewish or non-Jewish. They even call themselves aliens. I was reminded of this story um, where I have a, a friend who I used to um, work with in Leicester, who was from Hungary, and he he was um, and tr- trying to get his paperwork sorted when he came to this country, and he had to go to an office in the Leicester County Council, uh, City Council called Alien Immigration, Alien Immigration, which he thought was hilarious because he was really into this sci-fi program called The X-Files. Anybody remember The X-Files? Yeah. <laughs> so um, The X-Files was a, 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 a police show, but the, it was a special police unit who were investigating alien activity. He thought it was hilarious. He had to go to the alien immigration. But this is what the Ephesians were also experiencing. They were feeling like ah, there's some alienation, and Paul's describing this and how he talks about them. But the Ephesians were Greeks who had become Christians, and there would have been Jews in the church there who, who they would have said, oh, there's, there's a difference between us. And in fact, culturally, the Jews saw non-Jews and as what they were called Gentiles. And we see this written through the Bible quite a lot. And they even use the word uncircum- the uncircumcision. Circumcision being a mark of what it meant to be part of God's people historically. And they use it as a term of derision. You know, the uncircumcised would be like those who, who actually aren't really part of the true people of God. So as the Ephesian Christians, trying to get the feel, they're trying to get the feel for, for what this Jewish faith was about, where... Jesus had come as their Messiah. So they're trying to, he's trying to understand it. They're trying to understand it. However, they're sensing that there's culturally something where they're feeling on the outside. They're feeling like outsiders still. William Barclay quite um, helps us to understand how culturally, um, in, in the Jesus' time, the Jews would have seen non-Jews they would have, they, th- there was words that they used where they would call the, the uncircumcised or non-Jews or Gentiles as fuel for the fires of hell. That, that's why God made them. Now this is it's not in the Bible, but culturally there was this sort of like you know, animosity to the point that if in a Jewish household, if a son or daughter would go and ma- marry someone who wasn't a Jew, they would perform a funeral ceremony, a ceremony for that child, or for that young person to say, actually, they're, they're no longer part of us. So there was, there was a real, it was really ingrained. And so Paul's speaking into this and trying to say, yeah, there's division. There's this, there, there's this wall. There's this background that is broken. As we look at these verses, though, John Piper, he points out that there's this shift as you read through these verses. Um, In verse 12, it starts talking about us being separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. So if you're a a Jew here this morning, then you are included in the commonwealth of Israel but non-Jews are, will, be, will be seen as alienated from the commonwealth of Israel, culturally. 
They were strangers to God's promises and, and agreements or covenants. They, they were outside of all this heritage. And he even goes on to say they had no hope and they were without God in the world. So he's trying to emphasize, he, now these are, these are Christians, so he's not saying you guys haven't made it yet because you're not Jews. He's saying, I'm trying to emphasize that there's division that is historic and, and this is what it's like. But then as we, as we get to verse 19, further down, he starts saying, you're no longer strangers, you're no longer aliens, you're fellow citizens with Israel, members of the household of God. So there's a, there's a shift from being on the outside of all that God calls his special people to suddenly being on the inside and included in God's special people. And how did it happen? How do we go from being on the outside to the inside? John Stott, he, he, he points out that where this shift happens. And it's all focused around Jesus Christ and what he has done. There's two ways you can see this. Um, from our point of view, we were rebellious to God. And actually, we, we were not walking with God as Gentiles, as, as non-Jews, but also even as Jews. We have a rebellious heart that turns away from God. It's our attitude towards God. That means that, that we, we are separate from him. Yeah? So that's one side of the coin. And the other side is that actually our own sin, our own brokenness, our own choices to live life our own way without God has meant that God's righteous judgment on us is that we are, we can't come near him because he's holy. We can't come near him. The Bible calls that wrath. So those are the two positions, our position towards God, but then God's position towards us. So we're separated. There's this wall. And those two things are dealt with. First of all, Jesus bore our sin on the cross. He, he took on all our rebellion against God as if it was his own. And therefore, he cleaned us out and made us holy. Okay, so our position towards God, when God looks at us now, if we have put our faith in Christ, God sees holy, pure, righteous people. Okay? That's our position towards God. But our attitude towards God also has to change. Also has to, has to turn, so we have to turn back. And that is where we actively respond to God's sending Jesus, sending his son. His act of love we respond to and our attitude is changed. Do you see? So God turns to, has turned towards us and there's the beginning of a healed relationship as we're made holy again and right with him. And then our hearts are turned towards God as we respond towards God's love. Where's your heart today? Are you, are you actively responding to God's love and moving in that direction? Because he has done everything for you. So this demolition of this wall is happening through Christ, through what he has done. He destroyed the barrier. It says in verse 14 that he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and destroyed the barrier to the dividing walls. For the Berlin Wall story, the two groups were Eastern Germans and West Germans. In this passage in Ephesians, the two groups are Jews and non-Jews. But Jesus, through what he's done on the cross, has destroyed the barrier, has destroyed the wall, and made the two groups one. Do you think that the demolition or the pulling down of the Berlin Wall removed the barriers between people? in Germany, and in this world. Neither do I. Only through 
Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross can the barriers come down. Verse 13, it describes this geographical sense of being far away or being near. It says, we who are far away have been brought near. And this has happened because of two things. Again, similar to what I said about our attitude towards God and God's forgiveness of us and making us right with him. There's two things that have brought us from a far away position to a near position, which is a historical event that happened 2,000 years ago on the cross. When Jesus died on that cross, our sin was dealt with and it's just, it's just waiting for an event later in history and through history as people give their life to Jesus. But for us personally, there's an event in your life. If you're not a Christian yet this morning, I'm excited for you because that event is coming. The event when you give your life to Jesus, when you respond to him, when you say, I'm going to become a Christian and Jesus is going to be Lord of my life. So both those events together complete the reconciliation. Just because you live in a, a country that may have a Christian ethos, it doesn't mean you're a Christian. Even though the historical event of the cross still applies, it's only when you personally say, I give my life, I choose Jesus, he is Lord of my life, and then the wall is fully taken down between you and God. And as it does, reunification can happen. Reunification in, in Germany was obviously the, the families were brought to, back together that were separated. And it must have been an amazing thing to happen. And as we are reunified with God, we are brought together. So this is healed, yeah? And then this starts to be healed with each other. So through the cross, verse 16 says, through the cross, that in one body, to reconcile both of them, talking about Jews and Gentiles, but we can widen it, to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. Here, the hostility is of, of the uh, cultural Jews to the outsiders of what it is to be Jewish. And Jesus says, there's no more outsiders. And verse 15 goes on to, to describe how we're brought into God's family. So in Jesus, his intention is to, to make a new, it, Paul describes a new humanity, or one new man out of the two. So the two are the Jews, the, the, um, those who are Israel, part of God's people, and, the, and the, the Gentiles, okay? Who did Jesus come to save? Everyone. Where did he start, though? He started with Israel. He started with the Jews. If you look at through the Gospels, there's, there's hints and there's, thing, there's things about where Jesus is going to expand um, his ministry to, for, to, for all people. But actually, there are other instances where he's saying, no, I've come for the Jews. I, I've come to fulfill everything that God spoke for his people. And then... And then we know through the cross, they start reaching out and actually everything that Jesus has done suddenly is for everybody. It includes all. His death has put everybody on the same level. We are all the same at the foot of the cross, saved through God's grace. Paul finishes this passage with talking about a temple. 
In fact, I'd like to read it because it's, um, it's fantastic. So Ephesians 2, 19 to 22. Um, you can just listen if you like. This is from um, the New Living Translation, which is, is just really wonderful the way it puts it across. So you Gentiles are no longer strangers and foreigners. You are citizens along with all of God's holy people. You are members of God's family. Together, we are his house, built on the foundations of the apostles and prophets. And the cornerstone is Christ Jesus himself. We are joined together in him, becoming a holy temple to the Lord. And through him, you Gentiles, that's me, are also being made part of his dwelling where God lives by his spirit. In this last paragraph, Paul is using poetic language to describe the people of God, this new man or new humanity in Christ Jesus, as like a building, as like a temple. And in the Old Testament scriptures, we understand how um, God made a way by his grace for people to meet with him through animal sacrifice, through ceremonial laws, he made a way, but all of them were pointing towards what Jesus was going to do on the cross. And the place where they would meet is the temple. And they would become ceremonially clean through animal sacrifice, and then they could come into the temple where God's presence dwelt. So it was the building where God's presence dwelt. But that finished when Jesus Christ came because he, as well as being the end of having to go through animal sacrifices because he is a final sacrifice, he is the one who puts everybody right with God. And so the barrier between God and man is now cleared off. And as as Paul's describing a temple here where we are built together as, as the people of God into a, a holy dwelling of God, for, the, for the Lord, yeah? He's not saying build churches because now churches are going to be where I'm going to go. Churches are the new temple, yeah? Just go and find a church and you can meet with God. He's talking about us as being a people who were divided in so many different ways, culturally, our backgrounds are so different, our pasts are so different, our attitudes are so different, but because we are in Christ, because we are with Jesus, we are brought into one people, and it's the, this people, this community of God, which is called the church, where the presence of God now dwells. Whether it's in a home, when the people of God are there, the presence of God is there. So individually, we know from the New Testament, it teaches us that we have the Holy Spirit, which is God with us. He is, his presence is in us individually. But also, a lot of the language in the New Testament talks about a community of people, and that's where the presence of God is. That's why the, the, the first value we wanted to put for our values in this church was that we were... Please get it right. Seeking, our core value is seeking God's presence and making space in our lives to encounter God's presence. So that's of high value to us because Jesus has paid for us to become one new humanity and that's the church. Yeah, and, it's, and that's what's going to change the world is when, when this church and when churches across this world, like all these flags represent all this diversity, but actually we're, di we're diverse, but we are in one. We are in Christ together. And that is mind-blowing how that can happen. And being a people where God, the God of the universe, holy, powerful, and awesome, chooses to presence himself with us. And that's why we make time on Sundays and many different times through the week to say we're gonna get, we want to gather to meet with God because that, we believe that when we gather, his presence is with us. Clear, which is clearly taught through what Paul is saying here. So 
So I can, I can, you know, looking at the Berlin, I learned some things when I was reading about the Berlin Wall and how it happened. And, but you know, it's heartbreaking. But we know many places in the world, Iran comes to mind where it's a similar, the similar heartbreaking situations where we just think, why, why are people, why are governments behaving in this way? We can be critical of leaders in the way that they behave. We can be critical of our own politicians in the way they lead. And the way that we can say, actually, those are the ones who are putting up the walls. Those are the ones we need to say, hey, guys, come on. You need to change your policies because you're putting up walls. Why do they do it? But when I stop and look at myself, I see that when I feel threatened, I quickly put up walls to others in my life to those who disagree with me. In the time of the Ephesians and this letter to them, the Jews and Gentiles, they, you could say they were worlds apart. Yet in Christ, they were utterly united, brought into the fullness of the family of God. And I'm sure you can imagine different examples in your lives and people you know and in your own heart where there are walls, examples of walls. And you think, how, how can I sort this, this separation out? How can I get rid of the walls between people in my family, in my workplace? How can I do it? But in, in Jesus Christ, and only in him, there can be reunification and the breaking down of walls only in him. He will give us strategies of how to break down walls. But we have to keep coming back. That it's him, it's in him, it's in Jesus, it's in what he's done at the cross that is the only true solution. Everything else will just deal with the surface stuff and the walls will come up again. Let's look around Look around you. Look at all the different people in, in this room. Let's go on. I'll give you permission to look around. See if you can see someone who looks different to you. Someone who maybe uh, comes from um, a different country to you, different background to you. Or maybe someone who thinks differently to you. What God has done here bringing us together to Jesus is miraculous. And it's happening all over the world in what Jesus calls his church. As I finish, I just want to say uh, and that God is at work in this world, in the lives of people who don't yet know him. He is already at work in their lives. And just like when the Berlin Wall came down and the people swarmed through, this is the final image, yeah. The people swarmed through, you can see there. Let us as a church have an expectation and be ready to welcome those who are going to be turning to Christ in these coming days because God is at work on them, whoever that is. Let us be ready to welcome them and to celebrate with them. Jesus has done it. I'm going to stop there. Thanks, Dave.